So, um, our talk today is about psychedelic therapy and the question how much psychotherapy is part of it. So, um, thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, why are we here as two, as a team? Uh, it's because we have uh, different backgrounds in psychotherapy. That's the basic reason and that's why in the course of uh, a project about a psychedelic <coughs> therapy study that will hopefully uh, be uh, in, in the, in the uh, next future, maybe next year, starting in next year, will be maybe the first one in Germany to treat depression. Uh, but this we could talk about later. So we had some discussions about how to create a manual for this or which elements of the different therapy schools should be part of it. And so we want to give you a brief overview about historical and, uh, and nowadays contemporary um, approaches to this from the two perspectives, CBT and psychodynamic. So, okay, this is more or less our structure that we come back to from time to time. Like there you see uh, the behavioral aspects that Felix represent psychodynamic that I will talk about and the common factors of psychotherapy in general and substance related factors that we will also mention. So starting uh, just with uh, this brief remark that you all might know, or uh, I think you all know that the use of psychedelics in healing, therapy, ceremony, and divination, um, it has been thousands of years in, back in history that the human being is, uh, has been using it. So, but if we talk about nowadays, what is the <clears throat> psychedelic therapy model of the recent studies since the so-called psychedelic uh, Renaissance. It is the, and uh, we borrowed this term, thank you Max very much from you actually, who mentioned it first in, in the upcoming paper, the standard protocol. We call it like this. Uh, it means <clears throat> what all those research groups that you see down here have been doing since 2006 or 2011 um, to treat mental diseases with psychedelics and it consists of <clears throat> Uh, pretty high doses of psilocybin or LSD, um, working in this such a th therapy room with a patient lying down, wearing eye shades, hearing music, two therapists, usually male and female, um, um, for safety and support reasons. And uh, you have a three phase model of preparation, dosing and integration like Rosalind Watts was telling us earlier and the main issue is safety because we all want to establish a safe way of doing those therapies um, <clears throat> before we want to maybe try some new ways and differentiate those um, therapy approaches. And so there's a minimal amount of psychotherapy in this. Usually it's just support sessions, maybe some um, introduction to breathing techniques and so on. Okay. So. Felix, do you want to tell us something about the behavioral aspect? Yeah, thank you. So when we have a look about what is going on right now uh, in terms of studies, we actually do find um, studies who already apply um, CBT elements, cognitive behavioral therapy elements, um, in combination with um, the psychedelic state. So just in order to name um, two examples, sorry, the wrong way. Um, those are two examples um, Matt Johnson already talked about this morning, so I just don't want to get into detail. Um, so we have one study focusing on alcohol, um, using, for example, motivational interviewing uh, techniques, and we have another one focusing on tobacco, uh, using a whole package of um, manualized CBT elements in combination with uh, psilocybin. So let's go to like a, like a usual problem of um, CBT. Um, what we often encounter is some sort of oscillation between acceptance and avoidance. So what does that mean? So let's, let's imagine a patient uh, suffering from depression. So this patient, um, usually what he would do in order to prevent aversive stimuli, like for example, 
profound sadness or anxiety by certain avoidance strategies. Like, for example, rumination. Ms. Watts talked about this um, also um, this morning. So in order, to, um, in order to avoid those feelings, he would ruminate. And this would mean for the patient a lot, like a short-term gain, because he doesn't have to confront himself with the negative uh, feelings. But in the long term, it actually deteriorates um, the disease. So we as therapists actually try to, you know, slightly push the patient towards acceptance and relieve him from um, avoidance. And here, um, psilocybin or like psychedelic states come into play because the theory is that a psychedelic state actually punishes avoidance by pushing and pushing the, the patient towards the experiences he, he would like to avoid. And the, the more the patient tries to avoid, the worse it gets. But on the other hand, um, it rewards acceptance. Like for example, if the patient then actually dares to confront his feelings and he'll just let go, um, he will be rewarded by like a positive feeling um, or even something what we, call, what we call breakthrough experience, like going through a challenging trip and then having a breakthrough experience. So this is actually would mean a reward of um, acceptance. Um, there's a lot more about this theory, but um, actually uh, Max Wolf is going to talk about that uh, tomorrow. Um, more com comprehensively, which I highly recommend. It's a great talk. Um, <clears throat> so we can go on to another um, CBT aspect, which is the ACT, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, a modern approach, which um, is based on six <coughs> principles, and we go quickly through them. So we have mindfulness, but just in order to know how deeply I have to go into that. Can you raise your hand quickly? Like, have you heard about ACT? All right, so we go through it really, really um, quickly. Uh, we have those uh, six principles. <clears throat> and um, what we actually encounter from those principles um, in the existing manuals that are like supposed to be used in um, upcoming studies are those three, like in principle, we have all six, but like those three, um, there's um, um, a focus on. For example, acceptance, as this has been shown to be a positive predictor, um, in recent started from, from uh, Robin Carhart Harris, for example, a positive predictor to a good response is the acceptance. Uh, so this is why um, manuals stress um, the acceptance part of the act, and the values, because uh, in a psychedelic state, uh, patients like discover either new values or they get like uh, refocused on um, pre-existing values. Um, and then, thirdly, um, the mindfulness, which is um, thought to facilitate the patient by by navigating through the psychedelic experience. So this is why in um, some manuals, uh, like for example from NYU, they um, actually teach or train mindfulness exercises beforehand, like in the preparatory sessions. All right, so this just in order to name a few examples of CBT elements. Um, what about the psychodynamic elements? Michael, you want to tell us? Yeah, I will try to, briefly. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> actually there's nothing much done right now in the psychedelic uh, renaissance, uh, so I need to get back a little bit in history. So, uh, all those guys, you might know this one for sure, like the founder of psychoanalysis and his daughter, who uh, did some more uh, development uh, in the field of um, uh, defense mechanisms and the ego. So, and those two I just uh, mentioned because I think those are the real uh, uh, geistige Väter, like uh, intellectual father figures like Anton Mesmer, Friedrich Nietzsche, and others. 
So Freud didn't make it all up. He just uh, applied it in a clever way. And so those are like two um, uh, still living psychoanalysis uh, that, I, that I like, Irvin Yellum and, and Peter Fonagy. So just to briefly review how psychodynamic therapy works, you have the major principle of reveal and resolve unconscious pathology, uh, be it conflict or trauma or maladaptive patterns, childhood memories, whatever. And uh, this actually is producing symptoms that are not visibly, uh, th those are visible, but the cause is not visible. This is the ma major principle of psychoanalysis. And so those around are the common, commonly used techniques to, uh, to uh, conduct a therapy then, which is patient-therapist relationship, Regression, just think about uh, the couch setting um, where regression is already uh, taking place uh, because of the physiological uh, aspects uh, of the body. Free association as a major technique to just tell anything that is on your mind, even when it's painful or uh, appears to be not logical. Then dreams and dream interpretation. <coughs> the defense mechanisms uh, very central that will come up or are already there, like repression, rationalization, and so on. The transference and counter-transference, like the interplay between the projections of uh, patient and therapist and vice versa. The interpretation that is being done by the therapist from time to time to reveal uh, uh, unconscious patterns and then lead to insight. And of course, intellectual insight it's not enough, so working through the painful memories and emotions is the hard and long way to go then in the psychodynamic therapy. But to say that they started with very long and year-long therapies and now there's like good manuals in short-term therapy, uh, 15 to 30 hours, focal therapy and so on, which are very effective. So with this background, we see what happens wh when we add psychedelics. So who was doing this, actually? Maybe you know those guys? Could be. Who knows Hans Karl Leuner in this room? One, two, three. OK. So he's the major figure in Germany who introduced the psycholytic and psychedelic therapy in, uh, into uh, treatment, like psychiatrist from Göttingen. Here you see Ronald Sanderson from Great Britain, who coined the term psycholytic therapy in 1960 and was treating many hundred patients in the UK. And this is Stanislav Grof, who took up uh, the material that was there and developed some, some uh, slightly different forms, uh, especially combining psycholytic and psychedelic approach. Um, so I'll show you what, uh, uh, following the reports from those and other psychoanalysis psychiatrists happened when there were like those uh, let's say, <clears throat> additional therapists added, uh, Indocibine and Delusit from Zandos, and at low and moderate doses, uh, which is the psych psycholytic approach, there was described an intensification intensi and uh, elicitation of the patient-therapist relationship, um, and also an enhancement of regression, also age regression, to revisit some hidden memories. The free association was getting much stronger about dreams. We do not know so much. I did not find anything in the literature that uh, regarded uh, systematically how dreams change, but could be an interesting topic to do research about. Then, of course, this is key. The defense mechanisms, if you, as you have heard already, they are going down. So transference. Uh, uh, is uh, induced and, uh, and strengthened and the interpretation, well, who knows if a therapist makes better interpretations when the patient takes uh, psychedelics. It depends very much on the therapist, right? Uh, but insight is uh, said to be enhanced on the side of the patient, also during the session and the process of working through is intensified. And this is true actually, um, mostly for uh, people with neurotic diseases and uh, those who did not respond to uh, normal psychoanalysis. So the 
so-called treatment-resistant neurotic diseases, uh, anxiety, depression, and so on. So that was fairly successful until the prohibition in 71, and uh, then uh, research and therapy was shut down, as you might know. So just to, uh, for you just to look at the differences between the psycholytic and the psychedelic approach, low versus high dose, uh, and here what happens is symbolic images, regression, transference, and all of this, what I mentioned, comes up, gets stronger, and so intensifies the analytical um, process. And here it's the mystical and the peak experience that is key <coughs> and that is uh, searched for and that is uh, um, the motor for change. And here you have number of sessions embedded in a longer therapy, and here you want to create one single overwhelming experience. Okay. So, one more similarity or connection point I found is uh, there's, there's two couches actually in, in London. They're not very far, one from each other, and this is the one from Freud, and this is the one from the Card Harris study group. So you see also that in the setting there's uh, a lot of similarities, right? Like a cozy environment and an invitation to go into daydreaming. Okay, so far, Felix. You want to continue with the common factors. Right, thanks. Okay, <clears throat> so two uh, chapters now, like the common factors and the substance-specific factors. So when we look at the common factors, uh, this graph is helpful. Um, it's not quite new, but still relevant. And what we are looking at is the Lambert's Pi, uh, named by its author, looking at what actually makes psychotherapy work. Um, and apart from this big chunk, which is the extra uh, therapeutical part, meaning like uh, events that happen outside the therapy, social network that's changing, and so on and so forth, <clears throat> this is the therapeutical part. And here we see like the biggest uh, chunk is uh, the therapeutic relationship or the therapeutic alliance, meaning that am I as a therapist convinced that I can help the patient? And it's the patient on the other way around uh, convinced that he can be helped by the therapist. And this together forms the therapeutic alliance. Um, and this is thought to be much more responsible um, in the effect than uh, things like um, the actual approach or the actual techniques that we are applying or um, expectancy and placebo effects, which are 15% each. So what does it have to do with uh, psychedelic, psychedelic therapy? Um, the therapeutic alliance is thought to be um, vastly um, enhanced by the psychedelic state. Um, there's, as far as I know, uh, no studies about this so far. It's just a theory. Um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, that, that's what we assume. And um, now, substance-specific factors. Here we're looking at um, different axes um, standing for uh, different experiences of the psychedelic state. And when we're looking at the blue line, these are actually responders um, on the psychedelic therapy. And we see that on those axes here, like experience of unity, spiritual experience, Whatever, however this is um, uh, defined, uh, blissful state and insightfulness, those are actually the axes um, that predict a good outcome. As the blue line here, the, the high values on these axes are responders versus the non-responders which you see here. And there's another substance-specific factor which is um, after the psychedelic state, that we talked about, there's the afterglow. So this is a period of two to four weeks um, in which we have enhanced cognitive flexibility, flexibility and um, where the uh, psychosocial interventions are thought to be m more effective. There's also a talk on this specifically. This is why I don't get into detail here. Um, but I would like to move on with the hardest part, um, <laughs> combining all of this in one theory. Michael, yeah. you want to try? <laughs> Just an approach. 
So this is nothing that we made up, but it's coming from the great uh, research group uh, of Carl uh, Harris in London uh, and Carl um, Friston, who really spent all his life in uh, um, understanding the principles of the brain and activity and so on. So um, the predictive processing model is used in this approach to, uh, to inform the Rebus model. This is, um, who, who has read uh, um, this, this article? Of you, one, two, three. It's just, it's very new. It's just uh, came out uh, one, two, three months ago. But it's very interesting because it says like, there's an acronym for relax beliefs under psychedelics. And uh, this means, and the knocking brain, I should add. Um, it means uh, that this is a normal state, actually. Um, normal waking state and uh, cortical networks, um, for example, the default mode network, um, are controlling um, or are predicting all the time our next um, actions, perceptions, whatever takes place, where we have to put our hand, what, uh, what uh, comes next most probably, and so on. It's a kind of a way to interact most efficiently uh, with your environment. And uh, this little arrow uh, symbolizes um, uh, emotions, memories, um, uh, chaotic perceptions, and everything that is not in order, and that is produced by the limbic system. This is roughly uh, the approach. And so in the psychedelic state, what happens is that this cortical activity by the 5-HT2A receptor agonism uh, is weakened. So this one, uh, like uh, everything that is uh, in, to talk and to say it in the psychodynamic term, unconscious. In this study group, uh, they refer especially to Freud's old models, uh, saying that they, he was not so wrong. Um, so things that were subconscious, unconscious, um, come up and get into our consciousness. And this, if it was childhood trauma or whatever kind of uh, aversive memories uh, and feelings, can we can confront, we have to confront it. And that's why uh, psychedelic therapy can, can work. And interesting is that you can also look at it from a CBT um, perspective, saying that uh, material that was avoided before uh, is now uh, coming. You're forced to uh, confront yourself with it, and then you have the choice to accept it or to avoid it, but it will come back around the next corner, maybe in the form of pseudo, pseudo hallucinations or feelings that you cannot run away from because you have an internal experience that you cannot avoid. Um, so this is an integral model that can be interesting to, to form an approach of integral psycho psychodynamic and CBT approaches into psychedelic therapy. And coming to conclusion, uh, what would be the next steps to find out more in detail how much psychotherapy and which parts of it should be or could be part in psychedelic therapy of future. Um, we have to show that it's, uh, it's efficacy and safety and with the standard protocol. Um, and we are about to do this in Germany for the first time so that we open the door for more um, detailed research questions. Next step could be to compare CBT and dynamic approaches uh, under psychedelics and to see uh, which one serves better in which disease condition. And um, so investigating also s uh, specific aspects like acceptance avoidance with special scales that we want to maybe use and psychodynamic process scales and maybe dream research and so on. And thirdly, uh, I, we, we were pinning down like ideas how to design an integrative psychedelic therapy intervention uh, then you need therapy manuals and training program for therapists. And uh, actually, we just mentioned some things that should be part of it. And uh, so this is no more, no longer a psychodynamic or a CBT therapy, but something more complex that also takes into account uh, substance-specific things like set setting, peak experiences, and the meaning-making quality of the substance and so on. And not to forget personal community values because ethical questions are being raised, obviously, in the psychedelic state. And so they have to be taken into account in therapy. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh
Um, so we're now uh, trying to take, uh, to take the obstacles that we are confronted here in Germany, unfortunately, um, which is basically the legal requirement. And um, what we're trying to do, content-wise, is um, to treat treatment-resistant um, depression uh, patients with um, two uh, psilocybin doses with the <coughs> protocol. And this is a joint venture between those uh, three groups. So the ZE Mannheim, uh, the PI will be uh, the Kunda, who talked um, this morning, the opening talk, MIND, which you already know, and um, and that's from the Charité. <coughs> but do you have like a specific <coughs> question towards this uh, study? Or was that enough information? Right. We hope to start like next year. More questions from the audience? Yes, please. Uh, do you consider or what is the goal of this therapy? Is it like a therapy for like everyone, even if you're like a very rational kind of person? Do you think it could work for like anyone? Um, if you have the proper disease, uh, then <laughs> that proper disease. I mean, this is something I would like to look more into, like maybe the rational type or the type uh, that is, has a more neurotic depression, like talking about where it's coming from uh, and what is the personality structure behind it. Maybe this person needs a higher dose, maybe needs uh, less repetitions, maybe has, uh, uh, needs some psychodynamic approach around it. And uh, this is an interesting question. I think different, if you start to differentiate between different types of depression, then it, you, it can lead you to different uh, interventions. So maybe like a dynamic life therapy? Could be, yeah. Um, you were talking about uh, comparing psychodynamic approaches uh, versus uh, to uh, CBT approaches in psychedelic therapy, right? Like in, as a potential future study. Um, so when I uh, think about the, the psychedelic therapy part of that, uh, isn't the, the patient, like for the most part, like, like has, uh, have their, uh, their eyes covered and like there's not much happening. So is the, the comparison, like, is that happening in the integration phase and the preparation, or is it right because that's not gonna, that's not that much attraction in the... Yeah. Yeah. As, uh, can I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as you said, um, it's, it's actually the preparation and the integration phase where things uh, happen and are primed, if you want. So, uh, first you take a therapist who's trained in this method, then he will interview the patient depending on his framework, and maybe he will work uh, out some unconscious conflict, um, and by talking about it, you prime the patient maybe that he will, uh, this will come up in the session, and then you will start to integrate, like how it is described in psycholytic therapy. So actually, uh, you're pretty right. The session, the dosing session, will be more or less the same. But the therapists will be different from different backgrounds, and uh, the work before and behind uh, will be different. Yeah. OK, one more question, please. Hi. Um, I know we, we, we talked this morning about having, currently having data about um, psychedelic uh, treatments being um, easier to use than usual antidepressants or usual antipsychotics because you would only have to use them once or three times. You say we have more long-term uh, effects, etc. Do we also have data on psychotherapy uh, assisted with psychedelics being more effective than psychotherapy assisted with standard medication? Um, well, it's really hard um, to tell like the head-to-head -head, head -head comparison because what we're looking at now is like studies with uh, like really small sample sizes. And um, if we compare those studies th that we have now uh, with psychedelic therapy to um, the one you just mentioned, uh, like just regular psychotherapy plus SSRI, whatever, then we do have actually a huge uh, um, impact on the psychedelics. We are looking at effect sizes of 1, 1 1.2, 1.3, this is huge, like really huge. Um, the effect sizes of the um, studies like psychotherapy or um, um, usual uh, medication, we're looking at effect sizes about 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 6, something like that. 
So, but um, we have to be cautious about that because like really small sample sizes, a lot of biases that, we, that we're confronted with. Um, so I think like in the future, large scale studies with uh, psilocybin, we will see actually a decrease of the um, effect size. But if we compare it now, yes, uh, psychedelic therapy is uh, much more effective.